I'm Joyita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. We've just wrapped up Pride Month. Pride is a celebration of LGBTQS2 identity and a recognition of shared struggle. Though diversity and inclusion are important pillars of Pride, sadly, Pride Month too often overlooks LGBTQS2 members with disabilities. Accessibility issues are present in gay bars, parties, pride parades, as well as protests and rallies. The physical spaces of many of these events present obstacles for people with physical disabilities or with sensory sensitivities. The fundamental meaning behind pride is for everyone to be proud of their bodies, sexuality, and physical appearances. However, the same invitation is too often denied to LGBTQ people with disabilities. Today, we discuss making Pride disability inclusive. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Joyita Gupta, joining you from Accessible Media Studios in Toronto. We've just wrapped up Pride Month, and at least in Toronto, and I suspect all across Canada, we had a lot of big events and celebrations, lots of la- uh, rallies. Uh, there was a street market just uh, steps away from where I live, tons of flags, tons of T-shirts, tons of visibility for the Pride, uh, for, uh, for the LGBTQS2 community. Uh, but there weren't, at least to my reckoning, a lot of people with disabilities who were at the front and center. Now, this could just be me. But it just so happened that a guest that you have previously heard on the program recently wrote an article for the conversation. Alan Martino, who you might remember from a previous episode of The Pulse, is now an assistant professor in the Cummings School of Medicine, Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary. So when we last spoke, he was all the way in Toronto. Now he's trekked all the way to Calgary and his article Making Pride More Inclusive means creating space for 2S LGBTQS people with disabilities recently appeared as an article in The Conversation. Alan, hello and welcome back to the program. You know, I am so happy you came back. No, thanks for having me again. It's such a pleasure to talk to you today. And yeah, thanks for making this space for me. You know, it's always nice to see when we have guests back on the program that they've had some changes in their life, hopefully all good things. And now you've moved all the way across the country to to Calgary. Tell me a little bit about how you're settling in and how things are going for you in Calgary. You know, I keep saying to people that Calgary has actually a lot more to offer than we expect. Uh, I'm loving the community here and made so many connections with different community partners here. And it's been such an exciting time. People are really wanting to talk about disability, sexuality, gender. So it's been such an easy match, which is always fantastic. Uh, You know, you'll excuse me because I have the bias of a Torontonian where I think, well, Toronto is the center (laughs) of the universe, which obviously it's not. But when it comes to accessibility and disability inclusion, what is it like for you in Calgary? Yeah, it's interesting. There are some differences for sure, like in terms of access to spaces uh, and communities, you know. Calgary, you know, has a few limitations in that way. Uh, but what I found is that people have been so friendly and so patient. Uh, there is, again, that desire for self-advocacy. There's that desire for uh, more significant change and learning lessons from other provinces. But even there are some surprises along the way. Like I was recently in Saskatchewan, and I learned that they have these amazing campaigns about disability sexuality that are so progressive and interesting, right? So there are some surprises along the way here in the prayers. Well, you know, the producer in me started purring in delight when you said Saskatchewan has all these great campaigns. See, as soon as we're done talking about disability inclusion and pride, once the show is over, I'm probably going to say, okay, Alan, now tell me who you talk to because I want to get them on the show. Uh, so, Alan, I, I read your article in the conversation, and I guess that's the best place to start. What got you thinking about issues of disability inclusion in Pride Month? Because that's just wrapped up across the country. And what is it that got you thinking about the exclusions in Pride Month? Yeah, I would say two things. Uh, One, my own experiences as a queer person with certain uh, invisible disabilities. I mean, we think about my own experiences trying to navigate this community and feel like I belong here. Um, But also, 
you know, I worked a lot with community as a community-based researcher, and I often got requests from self-advocates, people with lived experiences, family members, and service providers about how do we support to ask LGBTQ folks with disabilities in the community. Sometimes I would hear some hesitancy from folks. You would be like, come on, you're telling us that people with disabilities are sexual, and now you're telling us that there are sexualities in the plural, that <laughs> not everyone is heterosexual. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, you know, there was also sometimes an assumption that uh, talking about sexualities in plural for people with disabilities, especially intellectual disabilities, is going too far or is too much. You know, so that really made me like, let's do a research where we actually ask people who are at this intersection about their experiences and challenges. Are they finding community? How are they learning and making sense of their identities, their experiences? You know, as a queer person myself, I know how hard it is it can be, like as a teenager growing up and feeling like you're different, like you don't belong or dealing with bullying. And it's a very lonely time for a lot of people, right? Um, so I wanted to understand people's experiences. Um, and I found lots of commonalities, actually. This idea, you know, you say there are commonalities. What what sort of commonalities would you say there are between the experiences of, of, of the queer community and some of the isolation that people with disabilities deal with on an ongoing basis? Yeah, it's very interesting. As two communities, right, queer people and disabled people, there's, there's a lot of shared history along the way, right? The history of being medicalized, pathologized, right? seen as deviant, treated as different, um, being given words that are derogatory, right? Like, and now play, reclaiming some of those words like queer, for example. So we have some kind of shared histories, um, but also in the community, when I talk to people who are at this intersection, it was amazing to see how none of them, not a single one of them, for example, had any information about queerness in their sex education classes. Right. And this is something that is shared by non-disabled people as well. But it really stood out to me. It's like, first of all, you're not talking about disability in sex education. And now we're not even talking about queerness and gender identity. So there's a serious gap here. Well, you're saying when disabled people talk about sex, we're not talking about queerness. Why is that? Exactly. So part of it is people just assuming that uh, people with disabilities, especially people with intellectual disabilities, cannot understand sexual identity. Right. Um, they don't understand they're childlike in a sense. They have no sexuality, no sexual desires. Um, that is, or the simple assumption that everyone is heterosexual. Uh, sometimes, even in my field work, I've seen moments where two queer people uh, with disabilities would be treated as just best friends, right? Oh, they're just best friends. That's why they're holding hands. And I'm like, no, Mike and Johnny are actually making out at the back of the building every time they have a chance. <laughs> it's more than just a friendship. So sometimes that infantilization as well, right? That assumption that people cannot identify as queer um, is a big challenge as well. And a lot of participants actually talk about how even when navigating queer spaces, one of the challenges is that they're not seen as being queer enough or even being queer, right? Right? They're just disabled, you know? That, that disabled identity almost subsumes other facets of someone's identity. But I mean... The LGBT, the, the whole the mo the whole movement around Pride is a recognition of you know sexuality, bodily autonomy, you know diversity within the movement itself. Why does this absence persist in the way that it has? Because it's not the first time I've heard this particular complaint about people with disabilities being left out of Pride celebrations. And I, you'll forgive the pessimism, but it may not be the last time we hear this complaint either. So what's going on there? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, there's not a lot of communication between communities. Uh, and what participants often told me is that in disability-related spaces, they could only be disabled or they were only seen as disabled. And sometimes in queer spaces, they can only be queer, you know, for example. Like there's, there's very little recognition that people can be both. First of all, uh, services are not talking to each other. So for example, if they want a service that is about uh, gender identity in disability support services, they will not get a lot. So they have to go into a whole different sector to find information. So this sector is already not talking to each other, which I think is a big issue. Um, the other part too, is that we're still not thinking about accessibility in a broader way. Sometimes I, I still hear from community people uh, that accessibility is simply having a ramp at the back of the building. And we all know that accessibility and access is way more than that, right? It's actually about meaningfully engaging and inviting people into the spaces. 
And it's about thinking about accessibility in terms of noises, colors, in lights, you know, spaces, uh, community. So it's much more than just building a ramp at the back. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest issues that I've seen still sometimes with pride parades or, you know, pride related events is that we're not thinking creatively still about how can we invite community in a way that feels right to their bodies or their minds. Why is it that we always just do the same kind of events over and over again, right? And why is it that access seems to stop at having the accessibility van? And even there, it seems to fall short. Uh, what sort of, what needs to change about how we plan Pride events so that more people with disabilities are included in that? Uh, I think, you know, people with disabilities know, <laughs> you know what, you know, we need in terms of making spaces more accessible. So I think taking some of those lessons, for example, uh, participants constantly told me that they wish they had more quiet spaces to celebrate Pride, like be in a space where they could just play board games and, you know, and be queer and feel liberated in that space with others. So protesting and being a part of queerness and queer community, it doesn't have to mean, right, uh, always just marching outside and holding a banner, right? I think what people are telling us is that protesting can take various shapes. It can be me writing a blog post for example, and mobilizing that, it means being active in online communities where I feel more comfortable, right? So we need to challenge what we think about community, how we mobilize and create and ask people in the community about what their needs are, but also walk the walk, right? It's not just a matter of talking the talk, uh, but we actually need to make changes. Uh, I remember in Toronto, mm, some years back, there was a lot of uh... Uh, I don't want to say scandal, but maybe controversy around pride and the inclusion of police uh, in pride in the pride parade um, and the Black Lives Matter movement and their allies really organized in, on a grassroots level to try and get that changed in Toronto. In fact, I believe they were successful in getting that changed in Toronto as saying that police should not be marching in the pride parade. Uh, do you think that it's because I, I've, I've just wrapped up an interview with another guest, and they said that it's past the point where we'd have to stop being polite about disability. Do you think maybe part of the reason we're not seeing the change that we want to, that we all agree is needed, is maybe because we're not being assertive enough within the disability community calling for some of these changes? I mean, it's hard to say too, right? Because I mean, it, it's hard when you're facing, for example, ableism in spaces that don't see you as a sexual person, don't see you as a queer person or queer enough. You know, like it's so much, sometimes it's a lot of violence that he faced, right? And in various ways, emotional, um, you no know, messages that he received, like you don't qualify as a desirable queer partner, like all those things take a toll on us. And I think that it's also needs to be acknowledged, right? It makes it very difficult to push back a lot of times. I think that as a queer community, we, need, we should not shy away from having conversations about intersectionality. One of the things that we need to be very careful, for example, is sometimes when we bring the issue of race in queer space, in some queer spaces, we are seen as being divisive, right? We want to divide the community. But I think that it's the opposite. We want to bring the community together by acknowledging, right, our differences and appreciating those differences. So every time when I raise my hand and I'm like, we need to think about accessibility or we need to think about disability, that comment should be welcome into that space, right? And should be appreciated. I think that also needs to change. So it's like, it's a, it's a two-way street, right? I think queer disabled people are doing such amazing work already. Like, for example, there's so many YouTube channels now by queer disabled people who are like sharing lessons about like how to make spaces more um, inclusive, how, what things they wish they had known earlier in their lives and talking to younger people who are, you know, at this intersection. Uh, there's so many now books there are TV shows like special, you know, there are podcasts uh, like Disability After Dark with Andrew Gerza. Like there's so much material out there, right? So it's not even like we don't know these things or don't have, you know, the the resources. I think that it falls to queer spaces and queer communities to also educate ourselves about all this material, all this knowledge 
that is out there already. But also, you know, bearing in mind that disability isn't just something that happens to a group of people and they're over there and they've got their special needs because, uh, again, just in speaking to another interviewer, the, I love that quote where she said the world is divided into two groups of people, those who are disabled and those who will be disabled. So when we start to think about access and inclusion in a more universal sense as a human condition that everybody's going to at some point become disabled in their lives or they know somebody who's disabled, how does, uh, you know, do you think there's some scope to, instead of talking about making pride more accessible and having ramps and checking off the, you know, the boxes, in terms of having, uh, maybe we, what we need to do is actually have a conversation about making pride more inclusive. Because when you talked about like, in a quieter space, um, I was thinking, well, it's not just people with disabilities who might want that. If you have a small child and you think they're getting a little too excited, maybe you'd want to take them over to a quiet place and have them play board games. So what's the value in thinking about universal design and inclusivity broadly when we think about pride? Absolutely. I think what I love most about you know disability and the work that dis- disabled activists are doing is that they're, people are showing that there are ways that we can do things differently and how everyone benefits from those, right? So, for example, one of the things that, you know, my participants often talked about is how, you know, when they want to talk about their gender identity or, or their sexual identity, right, they often had felt that they had to fit the script that exists, right? This is one way of being queer and be, you know, eligible to enter this group. But I think some of them were also challenging that very script. It's like, why do I need to learn to be queer in a particular way to fit in? Why can I just be queer in my own way? Right. For example, for some people, it was about like a lot of communication, like would they, you know, before having sex or having any kind of relationship with others, they would be very clear about what felt right to their bodies, what didn't. And I know every time I heard that, it was like everyone in this world should benefit from this, you know, having clear communication, you know, and be able to articulate what you like, what you don't like, what feels good, good or comfortable or doesn't. So to me, that's what I like about it, too. It's like. How about this um, things that we can learn and change that actually benefits everyone? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, speaking of change, and uh, feel free to tell me that I'm absolutely wrong about this, okay? Um, I, my feelings will not be hurt. But I think that um, just looking back at the Pride Parade and the celebrations around Pride in Toronto, Alan, I think those have changed a lot in the last 20 years. I feel like in the mid-2000s, like when I started university, I really felt it was more a grassroots community type of event, uh, but I just feel that in the intervening years, decades even, uh, it's become a lot more commercial. You've seen a lot of big companies jump on Pride, and you've seen a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of corporate sponsorship and a lot of money flow towards Pride. Uh, If I'm not entirely wrong about this, so with the with the caveat that I could be entirely wrong about this, but do you think that the sort of the commercialization of Pride and the corporatization of Pride has maybe made it more challenging to make Pride disability inclusive? Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, we might have been more able to have those conversations and more able to pivot and more able to make changes because it was a grassroots community activists coming together uh, and, and, and celebrating Pride Month. I think it's a very fair critique to make. Uh, I certainly noticed the same thing. Um, I think there's critique around uh, pride movements and pride parades now being taken over by companies that change their logos to rainbow colors for this one month a year, <laughs> right? And then as soon as Ju- uh, you know July is here, we just change back to the what the way things were. And I mean, we know, for example, even from uh, people in the community that people that cannot be open about their you know families in the you know in their um, work of workplace, for example, right? So they might try to use work, words like partner as a way to avoid, for example, saying that it's a he or she or anything else. Uh, so it's still so real. And I think that it's really unfortunate that, you know, we know that the Pride Parade really started as a much more radical kind of political grassroots, right? And it, it's been really led by people of color, by trans people, by, you know, like, these are folks that are the most silenced now, <laughs> you know, or the most um, or the least represented sometimes even, right? Um, even, you know, there are studies about queer spaces and what is called hierarchies of desirability. And what is interesting is like, even when we look at queer spaces and the bodies that are privileged in the spaces, it's usually, you know, white, thin, non-disabled, you know, male bodies that are privileged in the spaces, you know? And this reproduces also a lot of... Um, and then violence towards, you know, um, people uh, who do not fit that criteria, 
right? So you feel like you're not part of this community or you feel like you're less than or you're less likely to land the partner of your dreams or to have the nights that you wanted to have. And again, it, I guess that's where it kind of brings back to my own experiences, right? As a person of color, trying to navigate spaces where being a person of color and queer is not usually, you know, putting us at the top of the list. Um, it's very clear. We all know it, right? And it has such an impact on how we feel about ourselves, what is possible. And I see some very similar, like parallel with the folks that I talk to in the community with disabilities where they are comparing themselves, right, to this kind of a dominant image of what the, the best of the ideal is. And you just cannot see that it fits that, right? Whether you don't have the body or the skin color or whatever it is. Um, and it's, it takes a huge toll on people, really huge toll. So even in terms of representation, that was another big theme in the research. People are constantly telling us, like, I don't feel represented. I don't feel represented in mainstream media. I don't feel represented in this queer spaces or disability spaces. I want to feel represented. Right. And that's it. And it goes beyond a question of simply, you know, representation, because Alan, I, you know, when you when you talk about people with disabilities who are also queer, they also continue to face a great deal of systemic and institutional violence because they occupy the, those, those multiple marginalized identities. What would you say is the benefit beyond simply making pride, like it's one month out of the year, uh, inclusive of people with disabilities? What benefits would you, would you say would accrue to people with disabilities who are queer if pride makes more of an, an effort, shall we say, to try and be inclusive of people with disabilities? I think it sends a message, right? It sends a message that we do not only, you know, um, simply welcome people with disabilities in quotes, but we actually invite and meaningfully engage with the stable people in the spaces, right? Because it's one thing to simply say, we welcome people here. But what does that actually mean, right? Does it mean actually going to organizations like there are, for example, more disability focused and being like, we have all these events. These are the things that we're trying to do to make it more accessible. Do you have any other ideas? Are there ways we can collaborate? Like, how can we make the space better so folks here can come here? How can we create more partnerships, right? We have spaces and or service providers creating resources, but they're not thinking again together, right? So sometimes I see a very interesting resources for people to understand sexual identity, but it's so inaccessible. It's not plain language. It's, there's no like other kinds of images to support some of the information and so on. So how can we actually talk to each other much more and not just once a year, but really throughout the year, because again, it sends a message to people with disabilities about what is even possible. I remember some folks that I talked to, like they did not even see queerness as a possibility in their lives. They did not even have the vocabulary to talk about queerness or be able to say, maybe I am this, or maybe I can try this. Um, folks, you know, it's to experience so much restrictions, so many restrictions and so many silences around queerness that it, I mean, it becomes almost like what one participant said. It's like, imagine going to McDonald's and there's only McChicken. Of course, you're going to choose McChicken because <laughs> that's the only option. But if you, but if you had a bigger menu of options, uh, you might look at other options. You might kind of contemplate or try. It might not be your thing or it might be, uh, but at least you know that you have this huge menu of options. And especially, again, with folks labeled with intellectual disabilities in the community, I don't think that's the case yet. People are kind of raised with this assumption that you're expected to be cis, you're expected to be straight, and that's it. Well, communication is key. Alan Martino, thank you so much for speaking to me today. It's always a pleasure communicating with you, and I'm delighted you were able to make some time and come back to the program. No, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Alan Martino is an assistant professor at the University of Calgary. Well, folks, I got to run, but it was always a pleasure. Do leave me some feedback, especially about this conversation that we've just had with Alan Martino uh, about uh, queer and disability, and, uh, about LGBT uh, you know, rights, uh, Pride Month and disability inclusion. I uh, would especially love to hear from you because as a straight woman, I sometimes feel that maybe I'm not the best person to be having this conversation. So please, if you have any feedback about this particular episode, good or bad, I would love to hear from you. Now, there's a couple of ways in which you can reach out to us. You can write us an email, feedback at ami.ca. You can give us a call at 1-866-509-4545. 
1-866-509-4545 and just leave us a voicemail. Sometimes it's nice to hear someone just leave a voicemail uh, and you know be able to play that on the program. Just make sure you also give us permission to do that uh, when you leave your voicemail. Just say, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm leaving a voicemail for The Pulse and we will definitely try and shoehorn that voicemail into the program. Of course, if you're still on Twitter, you can find us on Twitter at AMI Audio. Use the hashtag PulseAMI. And you can find me on Twitter at Chawetha Gupta. I hope you will follow me. Uh, I do often tweet out content relevant to the show, and at least you'll get to know when future episodes drop. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you have uh, so you get notified about future episodes of the program. And until next time, this is me signing off on behalf of our team, which is Ted Cooper, our videographer, Mark Aflalo, our technical producer, Ryan Delahanty, coordinator for podcasts at AMI Audio, and Andy Frank, who's the manager at AMI Audio. And I've been your host, Juita Gupta. Thanks for listening. <laughs>